Greetings, YouTube. It's been a while since I reviewed a non-fiction book, and there's a reason for that. The reason is this. Brian Greene's The Fabric of the Cosmos, Space, Time, and the Texture of Reality. Brian Greene is a theoretical physicist, works on superstring theory. And in this book, he covers pretty much the entire history of theoretical physics, starting with Newton and moving up to the most advanced levels of super, of super string theory um, and the membrane theory that are related to M theory. And M theory actually doesn't have a specific meaning yet, and the M and M theory, it could be a number of different things. Membrane could be one of them. Um, it's also, uh, membrane theory is also occasionally referred to as brain, B-R-A-N-E, not the one inside your head. Um, and this is, thankfully, Written for the layman, there is no math in here. He does post put a whole lot of numbers in here, but usually to illustrate the size of something. So you know, it'd be like you know, ten to the forty-eighth power or something like that. Um, and he actually, uh, I think, at one point, he actually puts the number of zeros to show you how many zeros is it in this number, how big it is, or how small it is. Um, and again, it starts with Newton, classical physics. And then it moves through the 19th century, and it moves into people who are trying to reconcile some of the things that Newton had done with new discoveries. And eventually it moves into the early 20th century, and it deals with Einstein's special relativity, theory of relativity, and then his general theory of relativity. And then it deals with the revolution of quantum mechanics, and how people tried to reconcile general and special relativity with quantum mechanics because you know general and special relativity deal with really really big things and the quantum mechanics feels really really small things but the two theories didn't mesh so people begin to look at why they don't mesh um, and eventually out of this research grew quantum grew uh, super string theory which became super string theory which then has an agent of M theory and eventually into membrane or brain theory now, yes, these are all kinds of weird terms I'm throwing at you. I understand this. But the book is approachable. It's not an easy read. You really have to concentrate on what you're doing, which is one of the reasons I recently got myself a radio headset I can wear at work. So I don't have to listen to the news programs anymore. I can put on some absolutely mindless soft rock in the background. It, the, the headphones themselves cut out 25 dB of sound. With the music, I can hear nothing in that room. It's awesome. So, what Brian Greene has done here is helped me to understand the speed of light. Now, the speed of light may be something simple to many people. Einstein came up with the idea, you know, the, the whole concept of, of speed of light being a constant in 1905. It's not a new theory. And I just took the word of physicists when they said, you can't go faster than the speed of light. I'm like, okay, you can't go faster than the speed of light. These people are much smarter than me. They understand the math. I'm just going to take their word for it that you can't go faster than the speed of light. Brian Greene explained to me why you can't go faster than the speed of light, and it was wonderfully simple. He brings forward the concept that everything is moving at the speed of light already. You, me, everything. It's just that most of that energy is being taken up by moving us through time. And as you go faster and faster in velocity through space-time, as you begin to pick up speed, and you begin to pick up, as you get closer and closer to the physical speed of light, the amount of energy left to fuel time grows smaller. It's a sliding scale. If one's here and you get closer to the other end, you have less of the other. So if you were to actually get yourself all the way up to the speed of light, you would be frozen in time and you can't go any faster. And that's what light is, the, the, the light that we see every day. It's frozen in time, it can't go any faster. And that's why if you are on a sh vehicle, a ship, moving close to the speed of light, for you, time is moving at a relative, at normal speed. It seems completely and totally normal. But to the people outside your vessel who are watching you, you seem to be slowing down. Which is why if you were to get near the speed of light and make a circuit around the, the sun and come back again, huge amounts of time would have passed. 
It's time travel, folks, for real. And it would work. And they've tested this, that the faster you go, the less you energy you have for time, with incredibly accurate watches and clocks, with orbital um, tests and things like that. I think they even tested it on a plane once. Incredibly state, uh, accurate timepieces that let them t tell the difference between a timepiece on the ground and one in a plane moving very, very fast. And for that alone, for the fact that Brian Greene explained to me how the speed of light functions, why you can't go faster than it. This book is worth the read. He also explained why time travel is not possible into the past, which completely and utterly destroys so many good storylines out there, but it's true nonetheless. You can't, if you could go into the past, you can't change the past, and there's the key. If you could go back to a hundred different times at the same moment in time, you're not going to change it. If it's happened, it happened. You can't alter it. That's just the way it is. Moments in time are frozen just like every point in space is. Each of those is a specific location, coordinates in, if M theory is correct, 11 dimensions, 10 physical dimensions and one dimension in time. One of those dimensions is time, it sets everything in place. Now this isn't the world of classical physics. In classical physics, if you could track every single particle and the velocity of every single particle, you would be able to predict all future and all past behavior. This is a quantum world. Things behave differently in a quantum world. And this book gets into that. It deals with it on every conceivable level that you can think of. He knows how far to go in, and he knows when to say, you know, this part here is too complex to discuss it because there are things that are too hard to discuss in a book like this aimed at lay people. If you want to get into this on the level that you would need to grasp all of it, you're going to have to take a whole lot of science and math courses, which I'm not going to. But if you like physics, if you want to understand reality, the texture, the fabric of our universe, this book is really cool. I recommend it. It's not a small book. It's a dense read. But the illustrations are helpful. His style is approachable. He, he knows how to deliver these things in small enough doses over time, building on top of each other so that you aren't being overwhelmed all at once. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I'm definitely keeping this book. I'm gonna, I'll be referring to it again in the future. I know I will. Um, but again, if you like physics, you like science, trying to understand reality, this is a book that you just cannot miss.